Hello, hello. I'm Celeste, and this is Week by Week. On today's episode, I start out with a conversation with my husband, and we have a little Valentine's Day-themed conversation. Then later on, our guest is the lovely Dr. Tammy Uliano. Let's do this. Hi. Hi. We're back. I got more questions for you. I have my beautiful magic stack of question cards. The magic deck. The magic deck. Okay. All right. Let's see. Am I choosing this time or are you choosing? No, no, you're choosing. Okay. Okay. I'm spreading them like a fan for, you know, let's get the the imagery. Yeah. Last time you just had me just take the deck on my own and then I had to pluck it out. I know because I did. It's nice to have it like fanned a little bit. Okay. Oh. The person who taught me the most about love. Okay. Okay. I like this. I like this. Well, I mean, the most honest answer is you. Hmm. The end. (laughs) 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 Yeah, I mean. You can say me, but then I also want to hear like your number two then too. Okay. As much as I love to hear the nice things you're going to say about me, it feels a little strange to be like, all right, let's talk about me for the next 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Hey, I didn't come up with the conceit of the cards. (laughs) And I didn't, I just randomly pulled the card. That's true. That's true. And it's it's appropriate because Valentine's Day is right around the corner. It's coming up. It's coming up. Actually, yeah, Valentine's Day will have passed by the time you're listening to this. (laughs) Yes. But in our in our universe, yes. Valentine's Day is about to happen. Well, first of all, you just opened up the possibility that that the kind of love that I had always dreamed about was truly possible. Mm. That was because you did teach me a lot about being vulnerable and openness. You taught me how rewarding and meaningful it is to be fierce about how you love somebody Mm. and how to truly give yourself over to that Mm. and to be in the near term, take that trust fall, be a little less safe because when the other person catches you, it really is incredible. I think you taught me what it takes You taught me how rewarding it is. Mm -hmm. You taught me how challenging it is. (laughs) Uh, How many times have you said something along the lines of like, I've never loved somebody more or been more mad at somebody or something like that? I don't, there's, I don't know how it would be possible for me to be more furious at another (laughs) human being than I have been at you. (laughs) But part of that is because I love you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's. It's for very good reasons yeah. in the end. Yeah. but And we're doing it safely. Well, you yes. Know. <laughs> I'm just so happy I asked that question because it turned out to be incredibly self-serving. And <laughs> Well, I picked it unless, unless you magician no. uh, fooled me and made me take Is that this card. Your Is this card? your card? You're going to want to take this card. I'm just so impressed that it timed out so well that <laughs> we're just like right at Valentine's Day. And here we are with this love question. <laughs> No, but yeah. that's that's very sweet. What and then I think I think the other person would be my dad, mm. you know, and he you know, he had so much love for human beings and so much compassion and care. The thing that I just recognize about him and when I think about him and think about how he loved, quote mm-hmm. unquote. I mean, there's the love that he had for my mom, which was beautiful, mm-hmm. and he was both in awe of her and respected her and and loved her romantically. Mm-hmm. He wrote poems for her all the time mm-hmm. and he had that that way of orienting himself to her and and being connected to her. Cuz love isn't just romantic love and it's not just about a romantic partner. Mm-hmm. It's about how you project love out into the world mm-hmm. cuz it's all the same. Mm-hmm. You know, feeling and he just had so much love for so many different people and so many different walks of life and so many different arenas that he came across or mm-hmm. interacted with. And it was just like, it became such a running joke in our family, but we would like 
go out to eat and he would get like the life story of every waiter or waitress <laughs> that we would have. And by the end, he would it would be like he had just like this little little tiny mm-hmm. love, you know, mm-hmm. for them. And and but it was just he wanted to know people and he wanted to know what their stories were. And, you yeah. know, I think that 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 trait is something that I am so attracted to and aspire to be present enough to live that way with other people because I think it takes some slowing down oh yeah and some getting out of your own way and getting out of your own head and deciding that you want to connect you know and so that's definitely a a place that I always love people like that and it's something I really continue to want to try to commit to in my own life the thing that kind of bubbled up in my head when you were saying this is my dad's grandma is someone he loved deeply and was very important in his life. And we were recently talking about elements that made her so special. And he said something very similar that she just stopped and like genuinely connected with Mm -hmm. anyone and everyone Mm -hmm. she came across. And I just, I think it's just such a beautiful trait. Yep. I agree. Okay. So knowing all of that, Mm -hmm. what do you hope to teach our son about love? Mm. I think that right now in the world we are in, we've just lost a lot of curiosity and love for others in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so bad Mm -hmm. for our future. Mm -hmm. And I definitely want to, yeah, I mean, I am this person. I Mm -hmm. am my dad's son mm-hmm. in this way. I love to engage with other mm-hmm. people and meet new people and mm-hmm. and hear what is going on with them and I don't know if I'm as good at it as he was but I it is something that brings me joy mm-hmm. and 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 helps me express love. Mm-hmm. And I want to show that to our son and mm-hmm. I want to show him the rewards of that mm-hmm. and that we're all part of a larger it's community. Empathy, it's kindness. It's empathy. It's kindness. It's connection. Mm-hmm. It's Slow learning. Down. It's sharing. It's sharing. It's mm-hmm. it's so many things when you find those little moments of of little love mm-hmm. with people. So I want to show him that, and I want to show him what it means to be in a loving, romantic relationship, mm-hmm. and teach him how I love you, mm-hmm. and give him that example. Mm-hmm. So respect, uh, respect, communication, communication, openness, mm-hmm. patience. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then I think something that's really important that I want to, and this is hard to teach actively, but I want it to be always a part of the background or part of the landscape with our family mm-hmm. and how our kids view our relationship I want them to know that there's just something solid about it. Mm. I want them to see that things will happen. Mm -hmm. Conflict will arise. Conflict will arise. You know, sad things will happen. Mm -hmm. Things will not always go exactly as we hope them to go. Mm -hmm. But one thing that we know will be there is, you know, my relationship to you and that real love is there. Things don't always have to be smooth in order to know you're secure. Correct. That's a great way of putting it. I think everything you said is really beautiful. The last element that comes to mind in teaching our son about love and how to love is how to love yourself comes up for me. And you just can't fully show up for somebody. You can't love someone the way you want to love them. You can't be fully inside, I don't think, of love unless you are working on that relationship with yourself as well. Yep. Because it just, you can't get that fulfillment, security, everything else from other people. You have to work on that foundation in you. And I just, it is not a straight line. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just had a week where I was really hard on myself and had a really hard time getting out of my head, getting out of my way, feeling kindness and compassion toward myself. It is not a straight line, but committing to doing that work on myself and with myself and for myself absolutely has given me just a whole new level of love that I'm able to share with others. So I want to share that with you. Our guest today is Dr. Tammy Uliano. 
She is a professor of anesthesiology and primarily works with obstetric patients. So we dive deep into delivery, epidurals, the safety and science behind it. We talk about C-sections and she's also a mom of three. So at the end of the interview, she gives a really sweet parenting tip that I absolutely plan on incorporating into my own life. I just learned so much. So let's do this. Thank you so much for joining me today. So could you tell me a little bit about what your role is as an anesthesiologist? So I did a one-year fellowship after my anesthesia residency in obstetric anesthesia. And so since 1997, I've been primarily practicing obstetric anesthesia at the University of Florida. So I take care of patients, mostly labor epidurals, C-sections, and, uh, and because we're a tertiary care center, we get a lot of the, the very, very sick pregnant women from South Georgia down to about Orlando and west past Tallahassee. And then I teach our new anesthesia residents how to take care of pregnant women. I also help teach the obstetricians about the anesthesia side of what they do. And then, of course, teaching medical students. And I've done some research and development of some devices to help with different pregnancy disorders and maternal fetal monitoring. Do you mostly work inside kind of the labor side of things? Or do you do any of the... Okay, great. Labor and then obviously the operating rooms. Labor and delivery is in most places separate from the main operating rooms. So we're a floor above at, at our hospital. How is working with someone who's pregnant or going through delivery different than just kind of general doing anesthesia? Like, you know, because I'm, I'm guessing there's not only in the technical side, but in the kind of, I don't know, bedside manner or some of the things you consider, there would be differences. It is quite different. And most of our residents are kind of shocked at how different it is because usually we're putting everybody to sleep or even if we keep them awake, we give them so much sedation that they're for all intents and purposes asleep. And they, mm-hmm. if we do it right, they rarely remember us at all when we go visit them the next day. But obstetrics is completely different. We keep Our goal is to keep people completely awake and aware and able to participate as much as they can in the delivery of their child, whether it's vaginal or cesarean. Um, and also medically, it's different. The physiology of pregnancy is, there's a lot of differences compared to non-pregnant women at the same age. And so we have to take all of that into account with what medications we choose and how we dose them, as well as the goals to avoid as much as possible interfering with the process or, or giving b- the baby any of the medications. So when somebody is deciding on their birth plan, and let's say, you know, birth goes smoothly overall, when deciding between choosing an epidural or not, what are some kind of factors to consider or weigh when you're making that choice? What I try to tell my residents and also my patients is this is your delivery to be done in the way that you want it. And we're only here to support you in that. So whether that's an, an epidural or not is totally up to you. But we want to meet you, look at you, review your medical records, because if something goes wrong, we need to be able to take care of you in the safest way possible. And we can't do that if we are unaware of whatever medical conditions you might have. So we do a preoperative evaluation of every person who presents in labor, regardless of whether they intend to get a labor epidural. So our goal is to is to meet their expectations as best as possible. But part of our role is to manage those expectations. Some people think mm-hmm. that they will get an epidural and never feel anything after that, which is not our goal. And, and other people think that we have this devious plan to make sure that they suffer and request an epidural, which is also not true. I think a lot of people don't understand how... First of all, how we're paid. It makes zero difference to my salary whether each woman gets an epidural or not. I'm on salary. No matter how much I work or how little I work, I get the same amount of money. So so I have no reason to try to convince someone to get an epidural. My job is to make sure that their understanding of what we're offering is clear because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. Mm -hmm. And then to be available as best as possible if they would like my help. On the note of misinformation, is there anything that comes to mind that like tends to normally come up under that umbrella that you could speak to as kind of like, this is what I hear. This is kind of what I would say to that. Sure. 
So one of them, one of the most common ones is this will injure my back and it'll never be the same again. And there are people who say, oh, my back was fine until I had my last epidural and it's never gotten any better. And the answer I have to that is being pregnant is bad for your back. Delivering a baby vaginally or anyway is bad for your back. Carrying a baby afterwards where you put them on your hip and you're sort of crooked is bad for your back. And I often tell them about a, a very large study done in the UK where they asked a large sample of people who delivered six months later, do you have a backache? And the vast majority said yes. And then they said, did you have an epidural? And only half of them did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you have back pain after you have a baby and you go, ooh, why does my back hurt? Somebody stuck a needle in it. That must be why, right? So it's, it's true, true and unrelated. But when we have people with chronic back pain, the treatment is actually to place an epidural and give drugs through it. So we wouldn't do that if it actually caused the backache in the first place. So, so that's one major misconception. Another is if I get an epidural, I'm going to end up with a C-section or it's going to make my labor longer. That has been completely disproved in the last 20 years. Or it will make them use forceps, which almost no one uses forceps anymore. And yes, it can make it harder to push, but our goal is not to do that and to, to lighten up the drugs toward the end. But also, if women will use a mirror, which I know a lot of women go, ooh, gross, no, I don't want a mirror. <laughs> it makes a huge difference because then you get that, that biofeedback. Ooh, when I push like yeah. this, the baby moves. And when I don't, when I push this way, it doesn't move. So you get that feedback, the same feedback you would get as if you could feel. Those are the big ones. And then People who've read a lot about it will ask, well, if I get an epidural, then my baby's going to have to go into the intensive care unit because it'll get, I'll have a fever and they'll think the baby's infected. And mm. it turns out that the increase in temperature with an epidural is very small and does not necessitate that. That was a single study years ago, but it got a ton of press. Yeah, I, I don't think people understand how safe it is or how there are some useful things. So, for instance, if you have an epidural, and your labor doesn't go well, and we have to do a C-section, very often we can just dose up that epidural and you can have mm. your C-section without having to get another needle in your back or have to go to sleep. But it's not for everybody. I personally delivered two with an epidural and one without. The one without was a quickie, thank God. <laughs> so I've experienced it both ways. And, and I think everybody should have the delivery they want. But we as women should not act like if you are weak and get an epidural, then you're less of a mom because that's just yeah. not true. There is people will say, oh, epidural is a gift for, or labor, labor pain is a gift from God. And, uh, and you just go, no, no pain is <laughs> right. It's, it's a natural pain. Yes. But so is a kidney stone. And you would never tell your husband that you can't <laughs> get a pain medicine for a kidney stone, right? It's the uh. only kind of pain that for some reason we think it's more natural somehow to have pain than not. It is so interesting from what you're saying to me of like how much room there is for judgment over choices we make. And it's so important, obviously, to listen to your body and try to have the labor you want to have as safely as you can. It just really struck me when you were saying that just the opportunity to feel judgment or shame or like your choice is wrong, second guessing your choice inside of all of this, as opposed to feeling like, what do I really need to go through this enormous experience that you can't really prepare for otherwise? Genuinely, and I teach my residents this, there is a difference in amount of pain, not just pain threshold, not just some women are strong and some women are weak, but truly the amount of pain experience. Because women will come in saying, oh yeah, I've had a little bit of a backache for the day and they're nine centimeters. And another woman will come in literally screaming and not dilated at all. Yeah, You can't tell me that they've had the same amount of, you know, if you think about it physiologically, amount of pain fibers firing up to their brain. It can't possibly be the same. And one of them is just super strong woman. It kind of brings back to that first thing of like, well, it's your body. So it's just trying to figure out like what is the choice that feels like most right for your body. You're not comparing your labor, your pain or anything to anyone else's because they're all valid. They're just yours, you know? Exactly. And it doesn't make you any less of a mom or any less valued if you choose to have pain relief. And in fact, if your biggest worry is safety for the baby, you're better off with an epidural than getting IV medications. The IV medications absolutely cross 
to the baby, whereas the stuff we give in an epidural, well, anything that can get to your brain, so we call it the blood-brain barrier, anything that can cross that can cross the placental barrier so it can get to the baby. And so local anesthetics that we use for the epidural are very large charged molecules. They can't get into your brain unless they're in massive doses. And so they also can't get across the placenta. In fact, the amount in your bloodstream is, is negligible. You know, it would be impossible to do a study where we prove that babies who got narcotics at delivery are worse off than babies who didn't. But the pharmacology of it, the the physiology of it is such that it's better. It makes sense that it would be better. So telling people that they shouldn't get an epidural, well, telling anybody anything is wrong. (laughs) I think the best thing is to give everybody the details, as much data as they wish to have, and then letting everybody make their own decision. I could not agree with you more. In the most simple terms, do you mind just defining what an epidural is? Sure. So in your back, you have your spinal cord. Everybody's pretty familiar with that. Outside of that, it's it's bathed in fluid. That's called cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. And that's held in a, in a bag called the dura. And outside the dura is, is where the epidural space is. So the spinal cord has all the nerves coming out of it. So it those nerves sort of come out through the dura. And when we put the local anesthetic, the numbing medicine, outside of that space, it sort of bathes those nerve roots as they're leaving. And so it numbs those nerves, preventing nerve impulses from going up to your brain. So it doesn't hurt the nerves in any way. It just prevents the electrical impulses traveling on those nerves. And so it will be from pretty much from wherever we put the catheter down, Mm. um, depending on how much drug we we put through it. It turns out that all of the nerves from your uterus, if you were to map it onto your body, if we get you numb up to your belly button, you can't feel much on your uterus. And so that's our our goal is to, to numb up to your belly button. And it turns out that the nerves in the vagina and the perineum are completely different and a little bit harder to numb. So some people will have a good block during the first stage of labor, but when it comes time to push, they'll they'll have a little more sensation. And so we sometimes have to change up the way we dose the epidural. So the risks of it, if we go one layer deeper through that dura and, and go to where the fluid is, then that fluid can leak out. And that's where you get the headache. The It's called a postdural puncture headache or a spinal headache. It's a a positional headache. So you're fine usually if you're laying down, but when you sit up, you get this really awful headache. Mm. And so that's about one in a hundred people can get that headache. More commonly, if you're getting your epidural from somebody who hasn't done very many. So my trainees are more likely to get a, we call it a wet tap than I am. And then the other risks are vanishingly small, things like infections or bleeding that causes compression of a nerve that can actually Yes, paralysis is a possibility, but nearly all of those cases are in people who don't clot their blood properly, Mm. which in pregnancy, you clot your blood better than normal. And so that's highly unlikely unless you're on a medication to to thin your blood or you have a condition where your platelet count, which is one of the clotting factors, goes goes away. Got it. That's so interesting. Going back to the, did you call it a wet tap if that with a headache? Mm-hmm. Is that something that lasts or is that something that you might experience like just during the pregnancy and like immediately postpartum? Like what's the life of that side effect? So it's highly variable. If we make that wet tap with a, with a needle that we would use to put in an epidural, which that needle has to be fairly large because we have to put a piece of tubing through it. Mm-hmm. So it has to be bigger than the tubing. If you get a hole in your dura with that needle, then enough fluid leaks out that it could take quite a while to heal, even a week or two. And in my mind, that's not reasonable for you to try to lay flat for two weeks with a brand newborn. And so I encourage everybody to get the treatment. And the best treatment is for me to repeat the epidural and inject your own blood into that space. And it forms a clot over the hole and prevents it from leaking. And and it usually gets rid of the headache instantly. Oh, amazing. It's very safe. And I encourage people to get it right away because, I mean, you have to wait 24 hours, but 
some people go, oh, you know, let me go home and see if it goes away. And it doesn't. And then they're not moving very well and they're miserable. And then they try to get it fixed and they have to get back in and they have to get someone to watch the baby so that they can come back to the hospital to get the. It's just way more complicated mm -hmm. and interrupting of their life than it needs to be. When I was doing my pre-birth birthing class, they mentioned that there was both a walking epidural and just kind of like a regular or standard epidural. What is the difference between those things? Or is that something that you see a lot? Yeah, we don't really do walking epidurals anymore. So really what they're talking about is a CSE, which is called a combined spinal epidural. So it's basically the same procedure. But in once we get into the epidural space, we feed a tiny little needle through that that goes into that the space where the fluid is, and we put a very small amount of medicine there. That gets you comfortable much faster. And depending on what drug we use, you can be strong enough to walk. And so mm. years ago, people would do that. They would get that. We would thread the epidural catheter, the little tubing that goes into the epidural space. We wouldn't hook it up to a pump. They would get up and walk for a couple hours. Then the spinal drug would wear off. They'd come back to bed and we'd dose up the epidural. That was back when we thought walking sped labor, and it turns out it doesn't. And there's a preference for us to be monitoring continuously, which is hard to do when somebody's up walking around. In fact, if you have standard monitors, you can't. And so it's sort of gone away. So they might still call it a walking epidural, but what they really mean is just a combined spinal epidural. The new way to do it is mostly with numbing medicine and not with narcotics. If you put narcotics in, some people, the baby's heart rate suddenly goes down. We're not 100% sure why that happens. Plus, you itch like crazy. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so, so I don't do it with, with uh, narcotics anymore. I just use a, a small amount of local anesthetic. But what the way I teach it is if they're nine centimeters and miserable and about to deliver, then absolutely I would do it that way. If they're, you know, at three centimeters and we're just doing a standard epidural, then why make a hole that could leak if you don't have to? So that's that's the way I teach. So if someone has an epidural and they get to the part where they're pushing, do you try to make it so you have more sensation during that time or do you lessen the medication? Or I guess like what is the progression of numbness and how much can you or can't you feel from, you know, whenever you start the epidural through delivery? Yeah, it's completely variable from patient to patient. Depends a little bit on where we put the catheter, how high in your back or low in your back we put it, what drug we choose to use. Most places are doing a very low concentration of numbing medicine with a little bit of narcotic in it. And most of the time, we don't have to change anything. We keep it so that you can move your legs, so that you can adjust yourself in bed, and you can participate in the delivery. Maybe 10% of the time, we're called because someone feels like they're too numb, and we'll turn mm -hmm. it down. And maybe the same con amount of time we'll get called because they need what we call a perineal top-up dose. So we'll get a call that they're having too much pain right at delivery. And so we'll give a different medication then. But the vast majority of our patients deliver fine with the current dosing. And, and you know, it's, as we say, a bell-shaped curve, right? So everybody falls in roughly the same dose, but there's going to be some people who need a lot more and some people who need a lot less. So we start everybody at the center and then we adjust as needed to keep people satisfied with their with their analgesia. And some people really want, like when I had my last one, I wanted just enough so that I could talk to my husband and not feel like I was going to cry because mm -hmm. my baby wasn't in the standard position. Her head was twisted sideways, so it was the labor was much longer than anticipated. And, and I just felt like, for one thing, my husband was miserable watching me be uncomfortable. Yeah. And for another thing, I knew that I didn't have to be that miserable. So I wanted a very light amount, just enough so that I still couldn't really communicate during my contractions, but I also didn't feel like I was going to cry. When you are in a situation where you have to have a C-section and let's say things are happening quickly, what are ways that you can prepare yourself so you still feel like you have some agency in the situation as the person giving birth? So the first thing I'd say is communicate with your obstetrician and with your nurse. The nurse can be a tremendous advocate for you. Very often it won't be the obstetrician that you know and have gotten a relationship with. It'll be somebody else. And the nurses know all of them extremely well. And so they can advocate for you if you're not comfortable on your own. 
because some obstetricians will pull the trigger, as we say, a little prematurely sometimes, and others will be a lot more patient. So failure to progress, which is just you've been, your labor has stalled, is not an emergency. And if you want to keep going, you absolutely can, and you should say so. Say that you are, you're happy to, to, to wait. If you have a fever, though, and the baby's getting a fast heart rate from an infection or there are decelerations in the baby's heart rate that are worrisome, then, then that's a little bit of a different story. Um, and we have categorizations of fetal heart rate tracings and things like that. I actually have a, a little YouTube teaching video on that if somebody wanted to look it up, if they felt like learning about it. So using your nurse to help you and then not feeling like you're a failure if labor mm. doesn't go well because... You know, we've sort of selected against the extremely wide hips and the poor nutrition that made small babies and the things that made labor and delivery easier. So so it's not your fault if your baby doesn't want to come out. And if you've been pushing for three hours and the baby hasn't come down, there very well may be a reason. And if you wait and succeed, the baby could get stuck. And that can be a nightmare, a true nightmare. So Trust your obstetrician, and if you don't, then find a different one mm. or ask for a second opinion. But then once the decision is made, talk to your anesthesiologist about what you want. If you are so high anxiety and you are miserable, it's okay to ask for a little sedation. It's not going to hurt the baby if I give you a little bit of medicine to take the edge off of your nerves during the delivery. Almost always we have a family member join you in the back to hold your hand and take pictures. I'm happy to let, well, not in the days of COVID, but before COVID, we would let doulas come back if they wanted them to or, or whatever. We're happy to do whatever we can to make you make your experience as calm and safe as possible. When somebody is getting a C-section, I've heard, I had a good friend who got one unexpectedly and she said something she didn't expect was she shook like when the baby came out and that there was like a deep pressure when the baby was coming out. If you could speak to maybe what that is and what why that happens. But then anything else around C-sections that maybe we don't know about? 30% of deliveries are by C-section in the U.S. right now. The most common reason for a C-section is actually because you had a C-section before. So we call it an elective repeat C-section. But other common reasons would be if the baby isn't head down, so we no longer deliver vaginal breaches almost ever as of about 15, 20 years ago, because mm -hmm. it's safer for the baby. And then there's other less common causes with fetal problems or maternal problems. And then there are the ones that happen during labor. So either failure to progress, so your, your labor just stalls at whatever centimeters, failure of descent, the baby just doesn't come down when you're pushing, or non-reassuring fetal heart rate, which is when the heart rate tracing doesn't doesn't have the tracing that we'd like it to, to have that is reassuring us that the baby's okay. So when you go for C-section, usually we can um, do it with you awake. So we either dose up the epidural that you have or do a spinal. Mm -hmm. When you get numb, we have to get you numb actually all the way up to your breasts. The nipples line covers your entire uterus, even though the incision is down like in a bikini cut. Mm -hmm. We have to numb you way higher than that so that when they're working on your uterus, you won't feel any of it. So you can't move your legs, which is very unnerving to some people. It makes your breathing feel very different because your chest wall is asleep. You can't feel yourself breathing. You're still breathing fine, but your brain doesn't sense it. So it's interesting that a, a significant percentage of women feel like they're not breathing well. Usually the brain figures it out after a couple minutes, but initially some people can be very frightened by that. And then the shivering is very common. It's not a temperature thing, although we're mm -hmm. happy to give people warm blankets. It's actually not completely known why people have that shivering. Some people shiver just with labor, period. We don't think it's anxiety and we don't think it's cold. It's just a, we call it non-thermoregulatory shivering. So it's a, just a response of your brain that makes you shiver. And it's uncomfortable for patients, but it doesn't, the part of you that's numb is also unable to move. So your shivering doesn't affect the surgeons, doesn't mean that your bikini cut is going to be jiggly. It's, um, <laughs> it's just your upper body that's shaking. And we can give you medicine to make that go away, but we like to wait until after the baby's out so it's not exposed to that. 
And so we'll bring you in the room. We will hook up monitors. We'll get you numb. We always put up a drape so you can't actually see what's going on. Not that you could anyway, because they're operating on the far side of a hill that you can't see over. We bring in your family member to sit with you, hold your hand. And then the incision, they get down to the uterus fairly quickly, unless you've had multiple C-sections and there's a lot of scar tissue. And so the baby's usually out within about 10 minutes, maybe even wow. less. And your friend is right. So you can't push, right? Mm -hmm. And so they make the incision, they reach in and pull the baby's head up through the incision. And then the assistant pushes on the top of your uterus to push the baby out through the incision because they make a very small incision. And, you know, the smaller the incision, the better it'll heal. And so it takes some force to push that baby out. And it feels very strange. Usually it only takes a few seconds, sometimes a little longer. And then once the baby's head is out, then they suction the nose and then they push again to push the shoulders out. And then we do delayed cord clamps. So they have the baby on the field for another 30 seconds, letting the baby get more blood flow from the placenta before they clamp the cord. And then they bring it over and show the mom, usually, around the curtain. And then they take the baby to the warmer. It takes a while to close up. So time mm. from start to baby out is much shorter than time from baby out to getting out of the the room. A private practice obstetrician might do it in 30 to 45 minutes. A person in an academic institution, it's going to be more like an hour, maybe even an hour and a half, depending on how many C-sections you've had and how much they have to do to fix all the scar tissue and things. Can you still do skin to skin contact during that time? Well, we do. I don't know if every hospital does, but it's a big push from our from the nurses societies to get skin to skin. So they take the baby to the warmer, do the one in five minute APGARs, weigh the baby, maybe give some medications, dry them off. And then we undo mom's gown and put the baby directly on her chest with a blanket over. I usually take a camera and take pictures for the for the cute little family. Yeah, and the baby even can nurse while you're still getting your C-section. That's amazing. That's really interesting. What is the process for coming off of an epidural? Like, what are markers and what does it feel like? So as soon as the baby's out, the nurses turn off the epidural pump, unless there's needing to be a big repair. Sometimes there's some tears that have to be sewn up, and so we'll actually dose the epidural for that. But generally... It wears off sort of the opposite of the way it came on. So when we first place it, your feet and your bottom go numb and then your legs get tingly and then it progresses up until the contractions are, are much reduced and the opposite happens. The, it gradually moves down and your legs get stronger and the tingling goes away. And you might get some pain because we don't use anything in epidurals to keep you comfortable longer. In C-sections, we do. We give you a long-acting narcotic that stays in the epidural or spinal space that keeps you comfortable for about 18 hours. Mm. But but we don't do that for labor epidurals. So as it wears off, you'll start getting discomfort. And uh, and those freezy pads are awesome for that. Um, and you should ask for one and put it on before you have pain because that helps to reduce swelling. Most of the nurses will take care of that. Um, but definitely the first time you get out of bed after having an epidural or spinal, you should have somebody right with you because the brain's understanding of where your feet are is uh, comes back slower than your touch sensation. And so you want to make sure that you don't fall down, obviously. So we usually don't have people up for a couple hours. Oh, I feel like I'm learning so much. I'm like just taking it all in because there's it's amazing, even being somebody who has given birth, how much you just don't know about all the kind of ins and outs of all of your options. And I think that that's one of the things that makes it feel sometimes hard to feel empowered in the situation of birth because I go sometimes like, I don't even know what to ask, you know, like I don't know what's, what is going to lead me to the answer that I'm looking for. So it's so helpful to have you break all of this down. Thank you for that. One thing I think is important is to know what, like you just said, what the options are. So one option is prepared childbirth. So definitely going to classes, learning about visualization, Lamaze, whatever. I think that's huge. And just getting rid of a little bit of the fear factor by knowing what to expect can be very helpful. And then when you're in labor, well, depending on where you deliver, there are some options. So some places offer now nitrous oxide, which is an inhaled gas. And it can, for some women, give them a fair amount of pain relief. Hmm. We introduced it maybe two years ago. And I will say that the vast majority of people who opt for it 
still opt for an epidural after a while. It just makes us do it later, which I don't know how much you win by getting it at seven centimeters instead of five centimeters. But so it's not nearly as effective as an epidural, but if you just need to get the edge off and be able to relax in between contractions, then nitrous oxide can really help. You do only breathe it when you're having a contraction. Not all hospitals offer it, but in Europe, it's very widely used. Is that one of those ones, since it's not through an IV, it wouldn't? Correct. Okay, so it wouldn't affect the baby. Well, it's a gas, so theoretically it could get, I mean, it can definitely get to the baby, but we have no evidence that it's bad for a baby. We use nitrous oxide for babies when they have surgery, you know, after they're born sometimes. So, So we don't have any evidence that it's bad for them. The next option that isn't an epidural or for someone who can't have an epidural would be IV narcotics. And the the problem with narcotics is they're all relatively long acting. And in order to have enough to give you pain relief at the peak of a contraction, you'd be unconscious in between. And so that's, that's always been the problem with narcotics, that first of all, they're not the best way to get rid of that kind of pain. So for those people who haven't had a baby yet, the the pain of labor is not like a broken leg or a, or a toothache. It's, it's called visceral pain. It's pain from, from an internal organ, which isn't the same pain pathways as what we call somatic pain, like, like a cut on your arm. And so opioids, narcotics, those are similar words, don't work as well. And mm-hmm. so it takes quite a lot to really make people feel better. And then you're getting a lot of narcotic that's crossing to the baby and can make the baby not breathe as well once it's born. And so we limit how much you can have because we don't want you to not breathe as well. And and so it's really not a great way to do labor analgesia. And the only people we really give narcotics to are ones who can't have an epidural. Most people who are willing to get analgesia either want nitrous or an epidural. Not that many people choose narcotics anymore, but we're trying to avoid it as much as possible. And then there's some some blocks that they do in Europe that we don't do here, where they actually put numbing medicine in your cervix that can help. It's called a pudendal block, which is numbing medicine at two places within the vagina that can help with the second stage with the pushing part. Mm. Pudendals are done in the U.S. Paracervicals are not because they risk problems with the baby. There's a drug called Nubane or Stadol. Those are weak narcotics and they can help. Sometimes they'll even give them in your muscles in uh, birthing centers and things. The nice thing about those is is they're supposed to have what we call a ceiling effect on respiratory depression, which means you can get them, they'll help some with pain, but they won't make you slow down your breathing. But they also won't help that much with pain. (laughs) So often we give those, or at least we used to, we're sort of going away from that and just going straight to getting epidurals lately. Got for it. people who want them. What would make you not a great candidate for an epidural? The main thing would be if you have a if you're on blood thinners or if you have a complication of preeclampsia called HELP syndrome where your platelet count goes really low mm. because then the risk of you bleeding into your back and actually compressing your spinal cord goes up. And so anybody at that risk we wouldn't we wouldn't do it. Will you tell me a little bit about preeclampsia? So that's a condition where Somewhere in the middle of pregnancy, your blood pressure starts to go up. It's about 3 to 5% of American women get preeclampsia, more common with lower socioeconomic status and, and some other things like multiple gestation or if you have diabetes or certain other conditions put you at increased risk. Or if you had preeclampsia with a prior pregnancy, you're more likely to get it. If you keep the same dad, interesting, there's a dad factor in there. That's so interesting. Wait, do you know anything about why that is? There's some theories. There's something described in, I think it was Sweden, called the dangerous father, where if his mom was preeclamptic when she had him, and then he fathers babies with multiple women, all of them will get preeclampsia. But it is interesting. And if you have a patient who's had five kids, and then the sixth one she gets preeclamptic with, having not been preeclamptic before, you can pretty much predict that it's, <laughs> she was divorced and has a new dad for this for this delivery. Not 100%. But so I think it's going to turn out that it's a spectrum of disorders. So at the, at the minimum end is the woman who comes in at 39 weeks and has a couple of high pressures and they call it preeclampsia because she meets the criteria. And at the other end is the person at 24 weeks who suddenly has extremely high blood pressures and 
starts having problems with her kidneys and her lungs fill up with fluid and her liver starts to swell and her platelet count goes down. And those are, they, they might have seizures. So eclampsia is seizures and preeclampsia is supposed to be the symptoms that come before the seizure. I think they're very different disorders. And we did a, some research on trying to predict who was going to get this disorder. The most common cause of mortality from it is actually extremely high pressure causing a stroke. So we wow. take it extremely seriously and put people on medications to control their blood pressure. And, and often it causes us to it sort of forces our hand to deliver people early because the, the only treatment other than you know managing the symptoms is, is delivery. And once they are delivered, then within 24 hours or so, the symptoms abate. Wow. So you could potentially be free and clear of all of the symptoms 24 hours after birth. You can be. There appears to be some lifelong risk of mm -hmm. um, heart disease and, and blood pressure problems, probably more as that they're both present in that person, not that, you know, even if you hadn't had a baby, you would still be at increased risk later. But people who get preeclampsia appear to have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease later. How about postpartum hemorrhages. Will you tell me a little bit about what that is and like what the risks are, what to look for? I did an episode where I was talking about my postpartums, what I did and didn't expect, you know, in the symptoms and stuff. And blood clots were something that I did not expect to the extent and the size. I was like, um, I, there were twice I called my doctor and I was like, it's like the size of a plum. Is that normal? Uh, and they're like, just keep monitoring it. And I tell everybody every time I say this, like, Check in with your doctor. Do not take my word for it. <laughs> but that was one aspect of it. But obviously, postpartum hemorrhage is a more severe potential postpartum effect. Right. So, so the definition has to do with the volume of blood after delivery. So we expect three to 500 cc's of blood after a vaginal delivery and 800 cc's to a liter of blood after a C-section. And anything higher than that is technically called a postpartum hemorrhage. But there's postpartum hemorrhage and then there's postpartum hemorrhage, obviously. So the one that I deal with the most is immediately after delivery. So somebody delivers and they continue to bleed. And there's two main reasons why that might happen. One is the uterus doesn't contract down the way it's supposed to. And the other is that something happened and their blood isn't clotting normally anymore. Mm. So you could have your uterus not contract normally if you have retained products. So the placenta comes out, but a piece of it stays stuck inside. That'll cause the uterus to relax and the bleeding to continue. Or other reasons, if you have a super long labor, if you have a multiple gestation, so you have triplets that your uterus is sort of stretched out. So just like any muscle that gets overstretched, it sort of gets floppy or you have a really long labor on super high doses of Pitocin. And again, just like any muscle, it gets exhausted and just doesn't, doesn't contract the way it should. And remember that the inside of the uterus is sort of a rough edge of blood vessels where the placenta was attached. And if it doesn't contract and, and sort of self seal, then it's going to bleed. And so in those cases, if you palpate, if you feel your own uterus, right, you know, you can feel through your, it should be around your belly button. You should be able to feel the top of it. And if you can't, or if it feels very squishy, then that's definitely something you need to call your doctor about. Interestingly, the, the blood in the toilet turns the whole toilet red. And so it looks like a ton of blood, even if it's not. So it's really mm -hmm. hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, but clots are good. If it's not clots, then you get a little bit more worried because that could mean that something's gone wrong and you're not forming blood clots the way you should. Postpartum hemorrhage is still one of the leading causes of maternal mortality, even in the U.S. And so it is absolutely something to be taken very seriously. In the hospital, we take it very seriously. And so the first steps are feeling the uterus to make sure that it's firm and often giving extra Pitocin or other medications that will make it firm up better. And if they tell you they're giving you those other medications, ask for something for diarrhea, because if you take it beforehand, it's less likely to happen. Um, and then sometimes we can do things like go to the radiology department and they'll put a catheter in your thigh that they can direct into your vessels supplying the uterus. And then they can actually shoot some little coils into those vessels to stop the bleeding. We do that sometimes. It's called interventional radiology. 
There's also a device called the JADA, J-A-D-A, which is like a little vacuum tube that they can slide up into your uterus and sort of suck the uterus closed. Wow. And that works reasonably well. Or there's another thing called a Bacri balloon, which does the opposite. It's a balloon that they would slide up into your uterus and inflate, and it would compress all those bleeding vessels from the inside. So the key is recognizing it early, getting extra IV access, getting blood available. So we test everybody's blood type so that we know that we can get blood if we need it. That's how common this is. We want to be sure we have a blood available. We would never transfuse somebody just for the heck of it, right? So people say, oh, I don't want blood, but we're not going to do it unless it's to save your life. So you want to raise your baby. And I get that there's some religious objections and, and that's different, but you know, very few people need it. It's just, we're, we're ready for it. Is it possible to have a postpartum hemorrhage once you'd be home and out of the hospital? Can it happen after the, you know, 48 hours of birth? It's much less common, but yes, it's possible. Usually that involves some sort of trauma that happened with the birth that was missed at the time, you know, a uterine rupture or something that starts to bleed later. Sometimes it's not even bleeding outside your body, but you're you're lightheaded or whatever, and it turns out that you're bleeding internally, it's extremely rare. When we were preparing for this interview, you mentioned something called mommy days. Will you tell me what that is a little bit? So completely different. But so I had my first baby during my fellowship year, and then I immediately had two more because I was already in my 30s and I knew I wanted to have multiple children. So I had three kids in four years and was still working full time, which for a physician is in the 70 to 80 hours a week kind of range. And I wasn't really getting to be the parent I wanted to be. And so I took off a day a week. And that day I would pick up one of my kids, either from the nanny, if, uh, you know, before they started school or from preschool or school. And so of the three, they rotated. So each week I took one child out for three or four hours and we did whatever they wanted. Mm. And the dynamic of a kid alone with you is so different than even if you just have two of them together. Mm. Then they would tell me things that I, I know I never would have heard if I hadn't had alone time with them. And, and, you know, we would just go with one of them. They always wanted to go to a bookstore and we would get a cookie and sit in one of those big chairs and I would just read to her while we ate a cookie. Or my son always wanted to go to this little tiny zoo at the university that we would just walk around. It, it never was anything that cost a lot of money. It was just time with them. And I just so recommend it if you can swing it, even if it's a date night with one kid at a time. And still now all my kids are in their 20s. They're all finished college and in graduate school all over the country. And they still talk about their mommy days. And so it's just remarkable to me. You know, you do so many things that you hope will stick and be the important thing. And and that was the one that, for my kids, the most important thing that they've stuck with. And I love that you get some time to also really like celebrate who they are as an individual and like focus on their personality and their interests and share that. Like, just think that's so beautiful. I love that idea. Yeah, it was it was wonderful. And and the other thing I highly recommend if you're blessed with a spouse that is um, wonderful is is a date night without the kids because yes. you're gonna have happier kids if you have a happier home. And I think that was super important. My husband and I joined a softball team, so it, ins it made us go out every Thursday night. And so that's what I, I always tell young parents is pick a night and just go out that night every week, because then you just have a sitter that's going to come every Thursday night at six o'clock. Not, oh, we should go out this week. Well, we got to call a sitter. Well, let's see if we can coordinate with the so-and-sos. Well, they can't get a sitter. That and Eventually, you just give up. But we just said every Thursday night we're going out. We would invite others if we wanted, or we would just go to dinner ourselves. For us, the key was to be out until the kids went to bed because we wanted one night that we didn't have to do the... Well, not, not that we didn't love reading books and yeah. <laughs> that stuff, but every once in a while, you just don't want to have the arguments about, but I need a glass of water, but I need a whatever. <laughs> I love that so much. That's such good advice. And it's funny because today is Thursday and tonight my husband and I are doing a date night. Yay. So that time good out. for you. It's been really hard to prioritize, though, to your point. Like, it's something that aspirationally we were like, oh, we should really make this a weekly thing. And it has been 
near impossible. So you're inspiring me because I uh, heard how busy you were and you were still able to fit it in. So this is this is good for me. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to speak to before we wrap up? I would just like to say anesthesia is extremely safe. Both epidurals and general anesthesia, they are all extremely safe. And when you have concerns, you should absolutely voice them. Most of us who choose to specialize in obstetric anesthesia are sensitive to things. Unfortunately, there aren't obstetric trained anesthesiologists at most hospitals Mm -hmm. outside of academia, but we're all trained by obstetric anesthesiologists. And so you should never feel like you can't ask questions. And there are resources everywhere. And I have a website. It's just my first initial and my last name. And you're welcome to, to send me questions. Is there anywhere else you'd like people to find you or is the website? The YouTube, if they just search for my name on YouTube, that's where I have some talks on what postural puncture headaches are and what fetal monitoring is. So so they're welcome to to view those. They've got like 100,000 views, interestingly enough, not from my residents, of course, from from other people. Well, it's, there, it does feel like this kind of black hole of knowledge. So it's so amazing that you're putting that out there for people and, and helping us get more feeling of confidence in making these decisions for ourselves. So thank you so much for everything. I'm grateful that I had the opportunity. I'm glad I found you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Week by Week. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Week by Week Podcast and visit our blog at weekbyweekpodcast.com. Check out the show notes for more information about our guests and additional resources I used and referenced during this episode. This podcast was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic and recorded remotely. Our show today was produced by me, Celeste Busa, and Dave Hill, and edited by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Week by Week is a Gumption Pictures production.